Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're finishing off with Ian Juby's introductory video to his Complete Creation series. Last time he mostly just attacked times when scientists use the word science as a noun instead of spelling out body of scientific knowledge every time. Let's see if his arguments get any better. To defend the anti-science dogma of evolutionism, without even realizing it, you fall into illogical and irrational rhetoric. You must reject true science and embrace the science, falsely so called, that the Apostle Paul mentioned. Well, I'm glad you brought this up, because now I can point out that this Bible verse is listed specifically on creation.com's list of arguments that they don't think creationists should use. Though it certainly is worth pointing out that if you actually read through the list, most of the arguments on the list start with a paragraph explaining why it's a bad argument, followed by a second paragraph explaining how they believe the argument is true, it just won't get you to creationism. Sounds kind of like motivated reasoning to me. Uh, for example, science is strictly limited to the natural realm. As it should be. Though not all scientists feel this way, I mean, how many times do we need to do studies on the efficacy of prayer? Every time it's done, atheists hold up the studies as evidence against the supernatural, while the religious engage in post hoc rationalization, explaining how prayer actually does work, but you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, so it won't work when you test it. So no matter the results of the study, it doesn't convince anyone, and yet somehow these studies keep being funded by places like the Templeton Foundation. It cannot measure or study your emotions or even your thoughts. Tell that to the psychologists and neurologists. We cannot scientifically study what is outside of nature. Yeah, it is hard to scientifically study something that can't even be scientifically demonstrated to exist in the first place. Though scientific study may point to the extra natural. How would it do that? Have any studies been published that have pointed to the supernatural or extra natural as you're calling it? Just asserting it does not make it true. For example, it may come as a shock to my evolutionist friends that you believe in the supernatural. That would be a shock if it were actually true, but asserting that you know what is going on inside someone else's head is never a good way to convince that person that your position is right. It's more likely to end up convincing that person that you are obviously wrong, since they know for certain that your assertion about what's going on in their heads is wrong. And this is one clue that the video is directed at people who already believe, rather than at the non-believers, as creationists are likely familiar with verses in the Bible that assert that everyone actually believes in God, even if they are suppressing it, while the non-believer can can actually look to their own thoughts and beliefs and see that they don't actually believe. So you're reinforcing belief among believers in a way that is not likely to convince any non-believers. Molecules demand evolution, popularly taught at all levels of education, must violate several well-established scientific laws of nature. Let me guess, thermodynamics and biogenesis? Or are you going to take it all the way back to the Big Bang and assert that the singularity had some property or other that you have no way of actually verifying, but it seems intuitive, so you rely on intuition instead of evidence? It's always some trick like this with creationists. But even if his statement is correct, if evolution violated something that had previously been established as a scientific law, that would not mean that evolution is supernatural. That would mean that we had a flawed understanding of either evolution or that natural law or both. Admitting that mistakes are possible is not automatically a position of belief in the supernatural. Such as biogenesis and the second law of thermodynamics. So predictable. Well, if a process violates a scientific law of nature, then that means one of three things. Our understanding of the law is flawed, our understanding of that process is flawed, or some combination of the first two. In this case, it's actually nearly impossible to figure out which one you're misunderstanding. It's likely a combination of everything. That is in perfect harmony with evolution, which is itself a function of reproduction. And for thermodynamics, not only does life not violate thermodynamics, I mean, after all, the Earth has a massive energy input from the Sun, which allows for a localized temporary reversal of entropy, but it has been proposed that the development of life is an expected outcome of the laws of thermodynamics, as a planet with life can converts available energy into entropy faster than a planet with no life. So this view holds that thermodynamics predicts that life would arise as a more efficient mechanism of increasing entropy than non-life. 
then by definition it is neither scientific nor natural. How arrogant do you have to be to assume that you know enough about all of the various mechanisms of the universe to state categorically that if something doesn't seem to add up to you, that must therefore mean that it is scientifically impossible? Molecules demand evolution, by very definition, is a supernatural process. You do realize that you are made of molecules, right? I mean, hell, ignore us. Trees basically build their bodies out of air. Their main source of carbon is air, and their trunks are made out of mostly carbon. Trees literally build the materials that we use to build houses out of thin air. But the idea that we are made of molecules is just too much for you. Now, you are welcome to contend that the first life arose from non-life. It did. And that does not violate biogenesis, as biogenesis was specifically about complex life, like maggots, mold, flies, and the like. The first life would have been very simple, so simple that we might not even recognize it as life. But that is not scientific. How so? We have evidence of a time on Earth when there was no life. There is life now. Life must have come from somewhere. Life is made out of chemicals and compounds that can occur naturally. So it is reasonable to assume that life at some point developed from the chemicals and compounds that make up life. How exactly did this happen? Well, we have some ideas, but we don't know for sure yet. To assert that you do know for sure is what would be unscientific. That violates the law of biogenesis established by observation since the beginning of scientific study. No, biogenesis was specifically the counter to the idea of spontaneous generation, which was the idea that fully formed and complex life could arise from rotting food spontaneously. Biogenesis was established by Louis Pasteur by boiling broth in a special flask. Are you seriously trying to suggest that boiling broth, and then seeing that if you keep it isolated it doesn't cloud, somehow demonstrates that the formation of simple protocells and proto-life in prebiotic conditions which would have been nothing like the boiled broth is impossible? Because I can tell you that Pasteur's experiments didn't even attempt to answer the question of the origin of life, just the origin of certain organisms that like rotting food. One of the popular creationist arguments against the Miller-Urey experiments is that they didn't accurately recreate the conditions of the early Earth, which is true, but they demonstrated a mechanism by which amino acids could potentially form naturally, and we have since found many more mechanisms and have even found naturally occurring amino acids on meteorites. So the conclusion of the Miller-Urey experiment has been demonstrated to be valid, but creationists attack it for its inaccurate environment. Well. How is boiled broth a better representation of the primordial earth than what Miller and Urey set up? You would be venturing beyond what science can study because life has only ever been observed to arise from previous life. Yes, but scientists and creationists alike all agree that life had an origin at some point. There was a time when there was no life on earth. We disagree on when that was and how long it lasted, but we can all agree that it is a true statement that there once was no life on Earth. So everyone agrees that life had an origin, and several plausible natural pathways that could lead to life have been proposed. So to just assert that the origin of life had to be supernatural seems rather unjustified. Do you have evidence that it couldn't have been natural? Like actual evidence, not boiled broth? Now, the theory of special creation and the theory of evolution both inevitably venture into the supernatural. Incorrect. Special creation certainly does, but evolution only goes there if you start off with a gross misunderstanding of the science. Now, do you see what I did there? I used science as a noun to simplify the statement, body of scientific knowledge. See how I can understand that science is a process and still be able to use the word as a stand-in for a larger string of words? Creation and evolution are both attempts to use science to answer the four great questions of life. Who am I? Two, four, six, oh, one. Evolution doesn't answer that question. That's a question for you to answer yourself. Where did I come from? Well, as Ramstein so eloquently put it, you have a P word, I have a D word. So what's the problem? Let's do it quick. Nobody tell Ben Shapiro about that song. It'll blow his poor little mind. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet-ass P-word. Why am I here? See the answer to where did I come from. 
Now, if you mean what is the purpose to your life, then again, that's something you get to decide for yourself. And evolution doesn't have anything to do with that. And where am I going? Today? Nowhere. It's movie night, so we stay in and watch a movie with the kids. With my life? Anywhere I want. See the answer to the previous question. Evolution doesn't attempt to answer any of these at all. If we're looking at these questions scientifically, the answers are all quite dull. If we're looking at them philosophically, you can answer them however you like, but the only question that the theory of evolution even attempts to answer is how did the species on the planet get so diverse? Now, certainly in seeking to answer this question, many more questions and answers have come up, but that is the big one at the base of evolutionary biology. The two models of creation or evolution exhaust all other possibilities. Our origins will be found in one of these two models. If you're including abiogenesis in the theory of evolution, then yes, the origin of life was either a chemical reaction or magic. Since we see that the continuation of life can be broken down to a series of cascading chemical reactions, and we have never seen a demonstrable example of magic, my money's on the chemical reaction. Uh, for example, there are some who claim that we were genetically engineered here on Earth by aliens. Well, I am sure that there are people out there that believe this, usually actual aliens designing us are proposed as a hypothetical that is used to point out that they would have still had to have developed through some kind of evolutionary mechanisms first. So we still have all the same questions as before the aliens, so there's no real benefit to proposing aliens. Alternatively, panspermia is the idea that some of the ingredients for life formed off-planet and came to the Earth through meteor and asteroid impacts. This is more plausible than actual alien designers, and we know it's possible because we've seen it happen. It merely brings up the question, where did the aliens come from? Oh yeah, you got us. No one's ever thought of that one before. Checkmate, we lose. We should all be creationists now. I'm so glad you thought of that. Attacking those who present scientific evidence is, by definition, anti-science behavior. Well, good thing I'm not attacking you. I try to focus on the science being presented, and what I find is that on the creationist side, the arguments rely almost entirely on quote mining, cherry picking, and misrepresentation. And I challenge you to find even one observed example in all of scientific history of macroevolution. Okay. How about when a species of unicellular algae developed the trait of multicellularity as a defense mechanism against a filter-feeding amoeba? That's a pretty big evolutionary step, one of the ones that creationists love to bring up as being completely impossible, but it took the algae less than a year. There's also E. coli, which developed the ability to metabolize citrate. I know that doesn't sound impressive, but E. coli is pretty much defined by the fact that it does not metabolize citrate. So this evolution to take advantage of a new food source is really quite significant. So there, you asked for one, I gave you two. And there's more. Macroevolution, when the term is used scientifically, simply means evolution above the level of species, which is a rather arbitrary line, but it works. There are long lists that are easy to find of observed speciation events, so macroevolution by definition. But yeah, nothing that fits the creationist misdefinition of macroevolution like a moth growing a scorpion tail. You know, the kind of thing that creationists have been told repeatedly is not predicted by the theory of evolution, and so observation of such an event would actually be a step in the direction of falsifying the theory as a whole? With the two conflicting models of creation and evolution, we may not be able to prove one model or the other, but we can certainly disprove or falsify one of them. Yes, we certainly can. Now guess which one has been thoroughly falsified? I went into detail on that in my Evolution Stole My Cookies video, so I'm not rehashing that here, but spoiler, it was not evolution that was falsified. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Gear Smoke, who says, This might be a stupid question, but if internal pregnancies are unique to mammals, then what are viviparous live-bearing fish and snakes doing? Well, Gear Smoke, that's actually not a stupid question at all. It's an excellent question. I misspoke. I really should have known better since, you know, I'm in the process of setting up a guppy breeding tank for my son. Guppies, the live-bearing fish. I was actually surprised to learn that viviparity, or internal pregnancy, has actually evolved about 150 times independently in vertebrates, and it's thought that viviparity is a mechanism that stimulates diversity. Something about internal pregnancies makes it easier for that species to diversify than one that lays eggs. 
With fish, there are two major factors that probably account for this. One single viviparous female can colonize a new watershed by herself if she were fertilized before ending up there, while an oviparous female would need to end up in the new watershed with an appropriate mate. And since geographic isolation is one of the main driving factors of diversity, this makes sense. There's also a higher survival rate for the fry, or baby fish, for viviparous fish. The stage where they are just sitting there as an egg, just waiting for a predator to come along and chomp them, is skipped completely. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the viviparity to the fish that is my channel. If you'd like me to continue giving birth, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!